thanks very much for coming out tonight for this little talk. I always begin, though, by asking how many people live in this area, in the Lohidmo area, a lot of you. And do you refer to it as Brookwitlam still? Is that? No, you don't. Okay. Historically, though, it was part of Brookwitlam, and that will show up a few times. So when I mention Brookwitlam, this is your neighborhood. And how many of you basically grew up in Burnaby? Anyone here, more or less? Okay. I'm always wary because I did not grow up in Burnaby, uh, and most of my knowledge of Burnaby's history comes from, you know, reading books, going through archives, and doing that kind of research. And I'm always interested to know where people's own memories do or do not sort of fit in with you know, the, the book learning about the history of Burnaby. And Burnaby, in many ways, is sort of under-researched. There's probably lots of stories about what's really going on, who's pulling strings, what's happening in Burnaby that have not been brought to light. So if any of you do have your stories and insights about our past here, please do make them public somehow. So tonight. We will look at Burnaby's agricultural roots. And I was at the museum, I've worked at the museum for quite a few years, and it wasn't until about five years ago when we had an agricultural theme that I started looking into uh, Burnaby's agricultural history. And I discovered, lo and behold, there's a lot more than I realized. I knew it was part of our past, but I didn't know how much a part it actually was. So tonight we'll look at a little bit more, uh, more or less chronologically following sort of the development of Burnaby and uh, what happened agriculture. That, that's actually the Nicholson Farm, which, which is uh, near where the Bridge Studios is today. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a flat area, low flat area, and Nicholson Farm will show up again in another slide as well, one of the larger farms, early 1900s. So Burnaby, this is sort of a modern map, but Burnaby, of course, is always the land between New Westminster and Vancouver. And uh, New Westminster came first, as we all know, it has political reasons for existing. And agriculture in Burnaby started in small ways fairly soon after New Westminster was settled in uh, 1859. So possibly the first area that saw some agriculture was along Marine Drive, the North Arm area, or what we might call the Big Bend. Uh, natural cranberry bogs, First Nations harvested cranberries there. Uh, and a path went in fairly soon after the Royal Engineers uh, came to town. Uh, the path was developed into a road. It was used by farmers from uh, Richmond Sea Island area to bring up goods. Possibly about the same time, though another area was established in Burnaby uh, called Burquitlam, which is this area more or less. And the reason this area developed was because there was access. The Royal Engineers built a road from New Westminster to Burrard Inlet to provide a saltwater uh, emergency exit in case those pesky Americans decided to come up and uh, claim more land for the United States. So Burquitlam and East Burnaby, which of course is, is sort of an extension of New Westminster. It developed fairly early as well. Deer Lake area developed uh, agricultural probably about next, but not until the 1890s. One of the problems with uh, Burnaby was that it was the land between Vancouver and New Westminster. And people uh, preempted land in this area, usually the best agricultural land first, and then sat on it. The preemption laws initially didn't say you had to do anything really with the land. So the Deer Lake area was bought up early and the uh, original owner uh, sat on it until the 1890s and then sold parcels to people who wanted the farm. Uh, after that probably came uh, the South Burnaby neighborhoods. A tram went through between Vancouver and New Westminster in 1891. That brought people to the South Burnaby Strip and then finally the North Burnaby Capitol Hill area. Uh, North Burnaby residents, of course, don't like to think that they come last, but uh, there weren't too many people living there until Vancouver Heights was developed as uh, an exclusive neighborhood, and they petitioned to bring in the streetcar extension, and that brought people as well. So farming followed settlement. You had to have people here first, and of course, you had to clear the land. We do live in the largest clear cut in the province here. Uh, so you can imagine early inhabitants of Burnaby facing huge stumps after the logging crews went through. Apparently, there's as much tree underground as there is above ground, so getting the stump out was a lot of work. You burn them, you chop them up as best as you can with axes, you blow them up with gunpowder, you try to drag them out with uh, horses and oxen. You do what you can to get your stump ranch going. Okay. Uh, the tram played a big role too. Anyone who knows the history of Burnaby knows that the tram had a huge role in opening up Burnaby, not just by bringing people in, but uh, actually in creating the political municipality. The original investors in the tram owned land in Burnaby and they wanted to see its value increase, so they created the municipality so they could 
increase the property values. The tram coming to town, though, meant that anyone who lived in Burnaby who had anything agriculture could ship it to market quite easily. And that was one of the reasons why the Deer Lake area started to uh, develop as a farming area. The original tram line was fairly close to Deer Lake, and now the farmers in the area could load up their produce into the tram no, fairly easily. The strawberries that Burnaby used to grow back then. Was that, that wouldn't be all consumed locally, would it be shipped out of season? A lot of, well, a lot of it was. I mean, we had canning, but the idea, and we'll see in just a minute, the idea was that it would be consumed locally. Uh, that changed, of course, but initially it was fairly local consumption. So, so the tram is uh, built before the CQ Airway? Sorry? The, well, the CPR comes through town in the 1880s. So it does predate, but it kind of it runs along Burrard Inlet and it shoots straight through. So it doesn't stop. The tram, though, stops and picks up produce for people. It will stop, you can load it up. So if we can back up, you can just arrow left. So the, the tram had passenger cars, but also freight cars. So this is a photo from the early 1890s of people loading their strawberries onto a car. And according to one account, those cars had big canvas sides. And as they rattled through the countryside, the, the canvas blew in the wind. And people referred to it as the Flying Dutchman coming through Burnaby. Uh, so yeah, so the tram was a huge aid for moving freight and goods as well as people. So, so a lot of the farms were fruit and vegetable and dairy farms. And a few farms also had cattle. And there are also a few accounts of grain being grown, probably oats. Okay. Uh, you can see as early as 1896, and here again, it sort of responds to your question. Uh, people advertised Burnaby as a suburban or residential fruit growing district. And again, the idea was that you would support the growing city of Vancouver and the growing city of New Westminster. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Where would they advertise and to whom? Well, both New Westminster and Vancouver have uh, newspapers. And they're trying to get people to move out of the city. We'll, we'll see in a minute some more advertising. Burnaby is sold. Um, it's, it's, it's sold for in two ways. Uh, the first one is to people who want to have a country estate. So they're appealing to affluent people who want to come and have an estate. And that will come up in a minute. And it's going to appeal, once the tram goes through, to working people who can't afford land in Vancouver and Westminster. So the big lures for uh, migration and immigration really are Vancouver, primarily with its developing industries. Remember, Vancouver goes from a few thousand people to 100,000 people in the space of 25 years. So it grows really fast. And that's one reason why people in Vancouver want to see uh, sort of a market gardening center to produce food for the big city. Uh, so people are lured for, for sort of those two reasons. Country estates, if you're a little more affluent, and as we'll see, you know, your backyard garden. Okay, here we have your country estate mindset. So the Deer Lake area uh, in the early 1890s was bought by uh, more affluent, uh, you know, probably you might want to call upper middle class English gentlemen who wanted to recreate a slice of pastoral southern England. So they bought up a lot of the land around Deer Lake. The big name to remember is the name Hill. And Bernard Hill and Lewis Hill were prominent in the area. Lewis Hill becomes a bit of a wheeler dealer in property. And he helps to sell off patches of land around Deer Lake to people he approves of. You know, people who have a little bit of money, and they're English, and they want to have a nice country estate here in beautiful Burnaby. And they aren't farmers. They're berry growers. Okay, they're berry growers. Okay. Other farmers, oh, sorry, there we go. There's Mr. Claude Hill's produce. Look at those wonderful berries. They, they look more like raspberries or blackberries, but I gather strawberries were the big crop. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they are, but uh, you know, old black and white photographs maybe don't show them in the best light. You know, I, I find it always amusing, of course, to look at old black and white photos because the past had lots of color, but we just can't see it in the photo. Uh, East Burnaby developed quite quickly as well in the 1890s. Again, this is the Love Farm, and uh, the museum has the Love Farm House in its exhibit. And again, Jesse Love sold most of his produce in New Westminster at the Agricultural Fair. Uh, and a lot of it's consumed locally, but there also are canning facilities in New Westminster by the end of the 1890s. So some of it is canned uh, and shipped locally. I don't know how far it went. Uh, some of it might. I mean, the salmon stuff, I mean, a lot of salmon is canned there. I don't know about the Delaware frozen foods and that Royal City Canyon. That was like 
1830s or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was back in the 1800s. Yeah, New Westminster was at that time uh, seen as being sort of the gateway to the Fraser Valley. So agriculture played a huge role uh, in Burnaby, or sorry, in New Westminster, not because there was a lot of growing going on, but because it was the market town for the Fraser Valley. And back up a little bit into Burnaby, and it's the market town for Burnaby produce. And Jesse Love, who's standing there on the left, uh, actually was quite prominent as uh, a local uh, horticulturist who won awards at the fall fairs and was quite well regarded. Of course, he had 11 children to help him out on the farm, so you know many hands make light work. So he was a gardener, and, and I'm getting these terms out of the directories. So if you look in the directories from the 1890s, the names we associate with Deer Lake, well, they're you know, fruit farmers. Or... Look at those trees in the background. Just... Yeah, so... Yeah, so the area is being logged, and you know a lot of the trees uh, they're either burned by accident or you burn them to try to get them get rid of them. If you visit us in the in the museum, we have a series of photos showing the changing landscape. And if you go to that neighborhood now, of course, it's a regular suburban area. Uh, okay, and then down by the river, <coughs> we have farmers, and they have mixed farms. They have livestock. So down in the Big Bend area, so that's a little more mucky, not quite as highbrow as the Deer Lake berry farmers. Okay. So you asked the question about land. Uh, so BC Saturday Sunset, again, mainly a Vancouver publication, and they're advertising Burnaby land, $150 per acre. Wow, get it fast. It's going well. And there's a Saturday sunset from 1915. Hard to see the photos, of course, but the one on the upper right is a uh, successful strawberry field, and that, again, is in the Deer Lake area. So Burnaby is promoted, you know, Saturday Sunset is a, is a little bit, you know, a magazine for, well, it's a magazine, it's a kind of a newspaper magazine, and it's really aimed more at the, uh, the, the gentleman farmers who might want a little estate and uh, move to Burnaby. Glen Lyon, of course, another, another ad for the gentleman farmer who might want to come to Burnaby. And in the corner down below, it's hard to see. Oh, I can't even quite read it. It's too uh, scattered. Anyway, they talk about the virtues of moving into the area. It's wonderful. You can grow all the temperate fruit and vegetables that you, that you would like. Yeah? Uh, did they only advertise um, estates? Were there no advertisements for work? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of the, the smaller lots, but... Uh, okay, like no, Bur Burnaby, yeah, Burnaby's history, certainly at that time, is more as a commuter suburb than as the actual center of, of industry. So that was the big appeal about Burnaby. So as I say, two things. Come and have your country estate here. That's really for the minority. Uh, or land is cheap, you can afford to live here, and then com commute on the interurban trams into Vancouver and New Westminster. And that was a very common pattern. So uh, as Burnaby develops, there's only 500 people living here in about 1900. So what, what there is, I mean, people have local shops, but the anchor industries, it's like a shopping mall, your anchor industry is Safeway and London Drugs, and yeah, you've got a lot of little shops in between, but without London Drugs and Safeway, you wouldn't have everything in between. So Burnaby, so, so Vancouver and New Westminster are the anchor communities, and New Westminster, it has its own local shops and local industry, as we'll see, but it uh, caters to the bigger cities quite a bit as a commuter suburb, which has you know, changed a bit over the years, but that's still partly true today, I think. So as agriculture grew, especially again along the South Burnaby area, so the trams do bring people out who can't really afford you know, ex more expensive property in Vancouver. Taxes are relatively low. Quite a thriving agricultural scene develops uh, in South Burnaby. Uh, it's a big enough scene to warrant an agricultural hall. So if you're prowling around uh, Central Park one of these days, uh, try to remember you know, a time before 1920 when it had an agricultural ha hall. A lot of neighborhoods also had. How long did that last, that agriculture? It, it was torn down about 1920. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, the areas also had farmer's institutes. Berquitlam had a farmer's institute. Uh, there were several around Burnaby. This is a meeting of the Provincial Farmer's Institute in Victoria. Is Victoria. Uh, no, nope, it's a municipal building put up. I think it was put up by a local organization. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I don't, I, you know, I don't know if Burnaby municipality helped pay for it or if it was just local conscriptions, people who were members of the agricultural society put it up because it was 
you know, went along with another organization. But I'm not sure who actually funded it, which is a good question. Uh, so farmers institutes and their female equivalent, women's institutes. Ta-da, so there's a meeting of women's institutes uh, also in Victoria. Uh, and again, if you look into the history of BC, farmers institutes and women's institutes are, are huge there. They play a, a big role and they were here and there might still be a couple here. Uh, Ocala, after about 1911, it's on the shores of uh, Deer Lake. It also has a, a, an award-winning farm. Again, largely to feed the people who live in Ocala. So you talked about local industries. Well, there's a local industry. One of the biggest employers in Burnaby until what, 1980, Ocala close. Six, seven? Anyway, it was one of, the, one of the largest employers in town was the prison, for better or for worse. And it's on the other side of the lake from the affluent Deer Lake farmers, and they just didn't want to talk about it. Okay, here in Burquitlam, of course, our neighborhood here around Lougheed Mall and further up, it's uh, developed into quite an agricultural area by 1910, 1911. And the next slide I threw in, especially for this meeting, if you could have, yes, I guess you could read it well enough, but this is from Wrigley's directory in 1920. And uh, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you scan through the names, you see mixed farming, poultry, farming, poultry, fruit, mixed farming, clerk. There's a Coquitlam Farmers Institute and Burquitlam Agricultural Association. You know, farmer, fruit, poultry, farmer, fruit. A couple of beekeepers as well. So people are keeping bees. Yeah. And every now and then there's a teacher or a mill hand. Uh, you know, there's lots of gardens. There's a cannery man. R. Stickney is a cannery man. So someone's putting food in the cans who lives in this area. And some clerks, yes. Uh, where they're a clerk, I do not know. Uh, but the area isn't, you know, the transportation in and out of Burquitlam isn't quite what it is today, so they may not have gone very far. Uh, and you can see also in the upper left-hand corner, it said that, uh, says that, that Burquitlam has the finest gold course on the Pacific coast, and I think they are referring to the golf course that was up in the Coquitlam area, so typos even then. But uh, it's also interesting that Burquitlam gets a separate section in the directory, because Burquitlam, of course, means partly Burnaby, partly Coquitlam. Uh, these days, you would be either Burnaby or Coquitlam. And if you lived in Burnaby up until the late 1940s, your address really was either Vancouver or New Westminster because we didn't have a main post office. We had sub post office, but not a main post office. So we fell usually under Vancouver or New Westminster, but Burquitlam has its own identity. So it must have been quite, quite a scene. And if you prowl around this neighborhood as well, I know there are some old farmhouses that date back to the 1920s and some old. It's just home yeah. manufactured drugs. <laughs> <W> <gasps> yes, yes, it, it makes you wonder. Yeah, what does he manufacture? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun to look through these, these directories. They're, they're actually online. You can get them through the, the uh, Vancouver Public Library. Okay. Uh, the Lazelles area, we think of it now as the government road area. Again, small mixed farms in that area as well, and appealing to people who um, you know, aren't as affluent and their farms are partly to support their own family or largely to support their own family. Now the reason I'm showing Seaforth School is partly because it was in the Lozells area and partly because it had a school garden. Now this is not the Seaforth School garden because I couldn't find a photo of Seaforth School garden. But uh, following, uh, during the First World War, schools participated in victory gardens, grow food and vegetables so that you don't have to ship all of your major agricultural products locally. You can ship them all overseas to help the war. And there was also a strong belief that at this time, BC was losing its agrarian values. So the Ministry of Education decided we needed school gardens at our schools to help get kids to you know, get dirt under their fingernails and feel the spiritual renewal of working on the land. Of course, it didn't work, you know, migration to the cities kept on going anyway. But that's why I threw that in. So school gardens as well as family backyard gardens. Yeah, that, that's actually in Victoria. So that's not Seaforth. Yeah, that's actually in Victoria because that was the only photo I could find from that era of a school garden. You can tell we're looking at something just standing on the rink or whatever. They're not too interesting. No, no. And the reality was, if you did live in a real out of the way rural community, life was pretty harsh. I mean, we're not the most agricultural province uh, here in BC. 
Uh, Burnaby Heights, once it gets developing in the late 1900s as well, by late 1900s I mean 1908, 910, of course it follows suit. People have big backyard gardens, they have chickens as well. That's uh, just pretty standard. Which brings up the question, which came first, chicken or the egg? I think one of the interesting things about history as well is when you can tie it into your own personal history. And my mom grew up on a farm in Vancouver Island in the 1930s, late 20s, early 30s. And she had an inordinate fondness for eggs. And I couldn't quite understand why she was so fond of eggs. Well, then I learned a little later that her, hus her uh, father and uncle really got into the chicken business about 1927. They invested uh, you know, their shirts in chickens. And that was just before the Depression ruined everything. And I, I didn't realize that raising chickens was a big thing in the 1910s and 20s. And it became a big thing for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, chicken breeders came up with good chickens, good hens, to lay lots of eggs so that people could raise them well. Uh, chicken researchers also discovered how to make chickens lay a lot of eggs. They discovered what light cycles will do, you know, daylight uh, darkness cycles will do. They discovered what to feed chickens to make them healthy and to lay a lot of eggs. So by about 1911, the provincial government's really encouraging people to get into chickens. It doesn't take a lot of land, it doesn't take a lot of labor to raise chickens, and guess what? Mum and the kids can look after chickens as well. So put all those things together, people are getting really excited about raising chickens in the 1910s and 1920s in Burnaby. And we had some very, very large you know, poultry farms. People had ducks as well, ducks and geese. Uh, and some of the chicken ranches in Burnaby had 6,000 heads of chickens. So they were quite large. These are mainly in the South Burnaby area that I know of. So some of them were pretty darn big, big flocks of, of, of fowl. Like duck yeah, I think there are ducks and geese in that, photo is, in that photo. They weren't quite as popular as chickens, but they were here. And of course, almost anything you can imagine. By the 1920s, people kept pigs, they kept goats, they kept bees. <laughs> They kept you know, flowers. It was at the time that so people raised the ducks and goose, but now today no, nobody would raise the ducks and goose, but the people didn't raise the chicken, right? Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, now they, what, so what's the change? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and uh, chickens, again, bear in mind, they're mainly raised for eggs. Not exclusively, but eggs are the big thing. Uh, in fact, there was a, uh, a song came out in the 1920s, an American jazz song called Big Butter and Eggs Man. And that's because this whole idea of having a, one cow with milk and getting some, egg, uh, getting some uh, uh, butter and eggs, it, it, was a, it was a North American phenomenon, the rise of those two sorts of forms of husbandry. And so songs like Big Butter and Egg Man come out. There's a, uh, another English song, uh, Chick, 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 Chicken, Lay a Little Egg for Me. You might know that song. So it was, it was quite a large phenomenon, and Burnaby tapped into it as well. And Burnaby Backyard Agriculturist tapped into all sorts of things. This is up near Bonser Park, uh, rec center now. I'm not sure exactly what angle the photo is looking at, but it's in the Bonser area. The beehives are not from Burnaby. I had no 1920s old Burnaby beehive photographs. The girls with the flowers, though, are from Burnaby. And then in the lower right-hand corner, someone in the uh, uh, Big Bend North Arm area decided to put in a wildlife reserve so you could come down and hunt your own ducks and whatever would come back. More than bacon? I don't know if they do, but we're going to come to the question of pigs in just a minute, though. We're going to come to that, yeah. I think it makes logical sense because you eat eggs every day, whereas bacon, uh, if you kill an animal, it's not necessarily about the blood and the death, but it's just it lasts a few weeks, a month maybe, and then it's done. And then you have yeah. to do another one, whereas for chickens, you can have... Everything. They keep on going, yeah. So, so, and it's a lot easier to raise chickens. You know, all you need is a, a yard and a, a coop and let the chickens run around, throw out a handful of seed every now and then, and you know, maybe a few of them will get sick and die, but you know, most of them will carry on and yeah, they'll lay, lay a few eggs. You know, every few days, you'll get some eggs from them. Pigs a little harder to work with, and yeah, once your pig's gone, pig's gone. You also hear, oh, back it up one more. You also hear stories of exotic crops like uh, grapes. Some people even grew tobacco. Uh, you hear mink farms. Uh, you, know, you, you name it. If it could work here, people probably tried it. It was kind of a free market of agricultural experimentation. Okay, now we can move. 
Uh, and I'd also like to point out, though, that, that even though Burnaby was a very European community at the time, there was, there was diversity in the people who especially were involved in agriculture. Uh, we have a lot of names that are not English names, uh, uh, Scandinavian names, uh, Eastern European names as well. And of course, we do know that there were uh, Sikh and uh, Chinese workers who were brought onto farms, and they also owned Oh, well, they didn't own, they weren't allowed to own land, but they leased property and became quite successful. The Chinese market gardeners in particular uh, were extremely good at uh, farming on soil that maybe wasn't quite as productive. So particularly along the Fraser River in the Big Bend area, the landowners leased land to uh, the Chinese market gardeners who did an extremely good job at growing vegetables. And by the 1920s, they actually dominated uh, fruit and vegetable production in the area. They dominated it so much that that the province actually passed legislation to try to keep a lid on it. Um, how successful it was, I'm not sure. And one other little indicator too, if you read through this, this is from um, a newspaper around 1911, I believe, and it mentions in the middle that uh, an Awa, being the only Chinese to enter the lists, carried off at least two prizes. My guess if, is that if more Chinese entered, they'd carry off a lot more prizes. So they were definitely here. And a lot of people who remember growing up in Burnaby you know, always remember the market gardeners who lived in the area. So here we go, our value added real estate. Burnaby is now a hotbed of wonderful agriculture. And you can see there, this is probably a scene uh, around Deer Lake looking out over Burnaby Lake. Uh, if you've never been to the, the art gallery in town, separately uh, house, that is a small mansion and of course it, the land was bought in 1909, the house soon built soon after, and that really was a luxury country estate with agriculture. And so he was in with real estate in the uh, Mr. Sepperly was, Sepperly was involved in, he was, I mean, he was a businessman, but his wife, it was his wife's house, and she was from old American money, old East Coast American yes. money. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't his house at all, and in fact, when... Drafting yeah. Well, well when, when she passed away, he was allowed to live in the house for a few years, but he wasn't allowed to get the proceeds. He, was, he, he sold it and put the money into Separley Park and Stanley Park. Uh, there's an interesting history behind that house and the family as well that's sort of independent. So there we go, lots of market gardens, lots of promotion. So flyers, people put out booklets promoting Burnaby. The municipality put out booklets promoting Burnaby. Good fruit lands. You can keep goats, strawberries, raspberries, loganberries, flowers, vegetables under glass. So greenhouses. Were these good fruit lands parcels from the land that uh, you mentioned at the beginning that somebody came and set up the, on that land? Like there were three or four major areas in Burmese. Are these like parcels from those? Yeah, the, um, uh, I mean, I don't know the details, but, but People who preempted lands in the 1860s, I mean, and that's a whole story on its own, usually were people in prominent places, like Colonel Moody, for example, who was head of the Royal Engineers in eight, from 1858 to 1965. People had an inside scoop, bought what they thought was going to be the best land and sat on it, hoping it would make a lot of money and then they would sell off parcels. Uh, so there was a lot of that going on around the lower mainland, uh, prominent people still getting the good, and still going on, yes, yes, it's part of our history here. Uh, the, the specific area around Deer Lake, uh, Lewis Claude Hill teamed up with a fellow named Hart, a Mr. Hart from New Westminster, and if you go to that area now, you can see Hart House Restaurant. So Mr. Hart was a realtor and developer from New Westminster who liked to come up to Deer Lake with his family uh, in the summers. And Mr. Hart and Mr. Hill decided about 1903 when the electricity lines came through the neighborhood that this would make it a wonderful area to subdivide and turn into little estates for affluent people. So Mr. Hill, Claude Hill, was able to buy up a lot of land and along with Mr. Hart, they divided into the Deer Lake Crescent Estates and started to sell it off. Uh, that plan ran out of steam in the Depression just before the First World War and then the First World War itself kind of took the steam out of uh, people's bank accounts. A lot of the local wealthy people lost money during that time. And the, uh, the area didn't quite get as grand as people had hoped. So if you visit the museum, you can visit one of our exhibits called Elworth, which was built in 1922 right on that site. And it's a very nice home, but it's not a grand palace. I mean, it's nice. It's upper middle class, and it's still nice. And that area, of course, then 
remained affluent, but not quite as affluent uh, as the initial plans had. Of course, today the Buckingham Heights area is quite a, a wealthy neighborhood, but that's, I think, a slightly different story. So, there... Thank you for presenting kind of the process, how we got mm -hmm. from just a few people in the area to multiple parcels. Money, say. making money. There we go, good fruit lambs, look at those costs. So goats, uh, we have all those. We have small fruit gardens, suburban homes, honey, half acre lots. So, I guess my point is, it was really alive with this idea of agriculture. Oh, and roses, special roses, bred right here in Burnaby. And some of the operations were large. Uh, so for example, in the lower right hand side, the nickel farm, which was in the very, very, very first slide, it's uh, about where the Bridge Studios is now on the Vancouver border down in the lowlands. It was a self-sufficient commercial farm. It supported the family and they presumably sold their goods and were able to make a living out of it. The upper left slide though is of the, I believe it's the Price Raspberry Farm and it's overlooking Deer Lake, which is, you can't see, but it's down below. And uh, even though it was largely a self-sufficient berry farm, Mr. Price still worked as a cobbler in Vancouver, which was not uncommon for someone in the family to work elsewhere as well. So large operations, but a lot of them were small, you know, mum and pop operations. If you couldn't afford a country estate, at least you could own a patch of land. This is somewhere in the Burnaby Lake lowlands area. You didn't pay a lot of money, but you didn't get a lot of services from the municipality. So you got your patch of land, you had to dig a well, you had to put in your outhouse, but you could feed yourself. It is pretty bleak. Now, I'm not entirely sure if this house goes along with a story, I can't remember the people's name, who settled in that area. They did make, you know, do better, and then they moved up to North Burnaby a few years later. Okay. We also had a lot of poultry breeders. I had to show this slide. The swastika poultry plant. And this was uh, on Douglas Road, which is now Canada Way, not far from the Edmonds area. I should mention that uh, Miss Brown changed the name of her poultry plant at the uh, outbreak of the Second World War. It became the Douglas Road poultry plant. But Burnaby was home to quite a few very large poultry breeding stations. In fact, supposedly the world's largest chicken incubator was in South Burnaby in the late 1920s, or so the owner claims. The larger pattern though, even though there were large commercial farms, was that farming was something for the family. You could buy a large patch of land, mom and the kids could look after a couple of animals, chickens, pull some weeds, do some vegetable tidying, while dad worked somewhere else. Dad would get on the interurban tram, commute into Vancouver, commute to New Westminster, commute to an industrial site somewhere in the area, and work there as well. You even have lots of stories of dad who works at a mill, and he has to go off for three or four months at a time, and leaves mom and the kids to look after uh, the back, big backyard garden. So that was very, very common in Burnaby. Times change though, even by the 1920s, as Burnaby's population uh, increases, we're looking into the 20,000s uh, for the population of Burnaby by the 1920s. People are excited about agriculture, but they start putting limits on it. So for example, in 1921, they decide to clamp down on pigs. So here's a response to your pig question. Pigs can be kind of stinky. And people didn't want pigs living near where they lived. So Burnaby starts thinking in terms of, well, let's put some agriculture here and leave this area as residential. Uh, oh. And we start engaging in zoning. And zoning is popular in the 1920s. It's the latest uh, municipal planning fad. And Burnaby gets into it as well. And they decide, well, some areas are residential and you can't do whatever you want with your backyard property in a residential area. Uh, maybe some of you know more about goats than I do. Uh, but you can't keep male goats, but you can keep female goats. Only does anyone know if female goats are better behaved than male goats? They are, okay. That's probably why. And you can't keep swine, so no pigs. Now Burnaby had a rather special uh, depression experience, partly because it's largely a working class neighborhood. People are growing fruit and vegetables to support themselves. And the depression hits Burnaby quite hard. Now for some people, it's business as usual. So people carry on growing flowers, fruits, vegetables, and they come together and exhibit them. Other people, and here's a great little cartoon from the Burnaby broadcast in the early 1930s, a little bit of a joke about uh, the man is looking through a seed catalog and his wife says, now listen to me, oh, now listen to me. 
Every year about this time, you are a big, strong man, and you must have a garden where you can work out. Then the weeds get really health, healthy, your wind gives out. Well, I've exercised a hoe for the last time, so you better think twice I'm out for good. So he's going to garden, making his wife do all the work, and she's not very impressed. For other people, though, during the Depression, people like, whoops, whoop, got ahead of myself. No, keep going, yep. There we go, new, new businesses in the Depression as well. Someone starts a, uh, a bird farm, Burnaby Game and Bird Farm, where you can go and uh, hunt and get your, own, uh, get your own different animals. Bantams, pigeons, it's a different game. But for other people, like Elf Bingham, who was very active in municipal organization during the Depression. For other people, the Depression in Burnaby was quite severe, quite harsh. We had a very high unemployment rate. Uh, people were, in many cases, I'm sure, desperate. But we have a little bit of local agriculture to fall back on. So the uh, people on relief were encouraged to grow their own fruits and vegetables. They were at times given seed so they could grow their own fruits and vegetables. Uh, Mr. W. T. William T. Wilson, mentioned in this little newspaper clipping, was a huge, he was a local man about town and a huge proponent of do-it-yourself horticulture. And he encouraged people, especially people who were on relief, to grow their own fruits and vegetables. Another group which you may know of, the Army of the Common Good, was very active organizing working people in Burnaby to help them feed themselves. And they approached the municipal council to use Burnaby land to uh, grow fruits and vegetables for their members. Uh, the Army of the Common Good was quite active as well in different uh, co-op stores and uh, different systems of barter and uh, basically trying to help, uh, you know, help poor people get on. And it's also the forerunner of credit unions in Burnaby, as many of you probably know. Well, Burnaby limped through the Depression. Uh, the Second World War brought a little something different in, by way of agriculture to Burnaby. Mr. William T. Wilson, who you saw in the newspaper clipping earlier, uh, became actually the first mayor, uh, sorry, Reeve, of Burnaby when Burnaby came out from under receivership, which it was under for 10 years. And again, a big proponent of backyard gardenings. When the war was declared in 1939, uh, he, under the table, encouraged people to grow victory gardens. Officially, the national government, federal government said that you know, locals should not engage in too much farming because they, the government felt we couldn't uh, spare the seed uh, or the manpower. We didn't want to distract from the real agricultural commercial output that would feed troops overseas. But after a couple of years, the government changed its tune and started to encourage victory gardens. Well, people in Burnaby were already doing that. So people were growing their gardens to feed themselves. Any excess might make it onto the uh, national market. People across Canada were engaging in victory gardens as well. So it became a national movement. Here in Burnaby, of course, lots of people participated. We were sort of the center of victory gardening in the lower mainland. There you go, another post in a local newspaper about the Victory Garden Club. And Lockdale, which is, uh, I don't know what the modern term for that area is, between Capitol Hill and Burnaby Mountain, that area in there. And in South Burnaby as well, the Vegetable Garden in wartime, Victory Garden. So it was a big deal in the last couple years of the war to be a Victory Gardener. Lots of articles about how to do it, lots of people turning their backyards into Victory Gardens. Following the war, however, agriculture in Burnaby does go into a bit of a decline, and there's a couple of reasons for it. In general, family farms in BC go into a decline. Farming is becoming a business, and if you don't go big with your business, you're not likely to compete. And as one example, if you look into the history of dairy producing in the province, for example, in the 1920s and 30s, lots of small producers uh, sending milk into the distributors. The politics were absolutely ruthless. The distributors really tried to, um, you know, cheat. The producers, uh, they formed co-ops, such as what became Dairyland, uh, and then the, the politics were absolutely nasty. So family farms, as just mom and pop operations and the kids were, went into decline as well. Plus, Burnaby had a slightly new vision. The, uh, the uh, administrator who ran Burnaby for the 10 years during the Depression after we lost our local government, and that's a story on its own, decided that one of the problems Burnaby had during the Depression was we didn't have enough local industry. And that's when we got things like the first oil refinery and the Ford assembly plant. So Burnaby was opened up to a little more, a little more industry. But perhaps one of the big reasons why Burnaby's agriculture went in decline was because 
we saw more subdivisions. Post-war Burnaby saw subdivisions for veterans, for people fleeing the big cities to the suburbs. We got wonderful new subdivisions with paved roads and houses which had big yards, but they weren't quite the you know, quarter acres that homes used to have. And agriculture became a little less important, also as people could, you know, slowly started to buy cars and could drive into the city for different sorts of events. We also saw a new set of bylaws come into play in the mid-1940s that, again, start to restrict agriculture a little bit. Again, more of this uh, industrial vision for Burnaby. So you can uh, zip through and you can say, well, you know, you can use your land for vegetables, floral, fruit farming, truck gardening, which is another name for market gardening, nurseries and greenhouses, non-commercial, don't sell anything you make. But, you know, special conditions, you know, you have to have written approval to have any livestock. You don't want people to have too many animals. So the municipal government starts to clamp down a little bit on unfettered doing what you want in agriculture. But of course, agriculture holds on. A lot of people evidently got permission to do what they did. And through the 1950s and 60s, there are still some large farming operations. Uh, the upper left-hand corner, greenhouses in the Lockdale area in the 1950s, again, between Capitol Hill and Burnaby Mountain. Upper right, we have the Lubbock Farm, although our assistant curator tells me it's pronounced Lubbock. I'm not sure if anyone knows the proper pronunciation. Uh, do you know? If they I, I've, I've heard Lubbock, but I've been corrected and told Lubbock. And you've heard Seeperly as well. Hmm, keep that in mind. Uh, the, the, the Lubbock farm was uh, between uh, 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 Deer Lake and, uh, and Edmonds, too. And it, it lasted until the 1980s. They bred a lot of horses there as well. So quite, quite the farm. It's one of the few farms that had livestock, large livestock like cows. Lower left, of course, the Burnaby Winter Club. Uh, which is still there today. And in the early 1960s, it had sheep and cows grazing next door. And the lower right, again, closer to this neighborhood, the Stiglitz Mushroom Farm, which uh, did, was quite prosperous until the late 1960s when you know, even mushroom farming was squeezed out to the Fraser Valley. In 1965, however, the local municipal government had a slight change of heart about the direction that Burnaby would take regarding agriculture. And the new bylaws at that time recognized agricultural districts, mainly the, the Fraser River, North Arm, Big Bend area, but also some areas around Burnaby Lake and little patches here and there. And so you can have you know, your truck, gardens, uh, truck gardening operations, small farming, orchards, nurseries. Uh, even peat process, even mushroom growing, but you can't put it too close to your neighbors. And that's in an agricultural district, but we also have a slightly different district, the small holdings district. And again, you can have your gardens, your orchards, you know, moderate commercial activities. And under number four, uses permitted, you could even keep a few animals too. They're not going hog wild, but you can also keep a few animals. So again, a, a growing realization that maybe an agricultural component in Burnaby is a good idea. And of course, in 1973, uh, the Agricultural Land Reserve uh, enshrines the big patches of agricultural land in Burnaby as agricultural land, and they still remain in the Agricultural Land Reserve today. Now, I'm going to leave off here in the early 1970s, because I think by 1980, we kind of have, and, and I don't know, you should probably add your opinion too. My sense is that by 1980, we're starting to see sort of the, the urban Burnaby that we're more familiar with now. People I talked to who grew up in the 50s and 60s, they remember a fairly rural Burnaby. Even if you lived in a, a subdivision with black top roads, you knew that just a couple blocks away was you know, a farmyard or all this undeveloped area. I, I don't hear those stories after 1980 so much. Um, you, know, you start seeing shopping centers and you start seeing you know, more people commuting and less people uh, farming. But you still have an extremely large backyard garden. So if you would like to see, you know, see more about agriculture, we do have some agricultural exhibits at our museum as well. We have a farmhouse. We have agricultural tools. We brought along a few of our agricultural artifacts as well to show people. You might wonder what those are, and we can talk about those a little later. Uh, so you're welcome to stop by again and see what we have that's agriculturally oriented in our museum. So last slide, because of course we bring history to life at the museum. There we go. So that's all I have to share. And I'm wondering if any of you have some stories, especially if you've lived in Burnaby for a while, if you've noticed anything agriculture that you might like to um, 
let us know about. Last time I did this talk, I know everyone wanted to talk, talk about the chicken farms they remember as kids growing up. This was in South Burnaby, but yeah, they all remember chicken farms. Yeah? I actually grew up in North Delta and in a very nice part of North Delta, and two blocks in, in a very suburban area, there were cows hmm. and sheep. And you had no idea until you turned on a street and it was like suburb house, suburb house, big lot cows, suburb house, suburb house. Um, and that was like, that was in the 2000s, mm -hmm. I was in high school. So. But North Delta is still a little more agricultural yeah, today, I think, than Burnaby. Yeah. I, yeah, you had no idea until you turned the road and then you heard cows, and it was very disorienting. Yeah. So that's just. One thing you don't hear mentioned much is the, uh, not agricultural, but it's at where the old, what the SkyTrain station is now, the, the uh, maintenance area. You know, the the, the, the one by Edmonds? Uh, it's 20th Street. Yeah, yeah. On the I remember as a kid, that used to be a gravel pit. Mm. You try to find anything about it, there's nothing. Hmm. Now, I know one of the ravines not far from there used to be used as a dump. And there are some interpretive signs. Yeah. But, but I mean, signs of this sort of industrial activity, some of it is shown here and there. But yeah, a lot of it disappears. I remember looking at one time before, like it's never existed. And it was big one time. Wow, wow. Any agricultural memories? Oh, really? I have my doubts whether it's still in Oh, I'll, I'll have to look into that. I guess I hadn't heard that anything got pulled out of it. Well, you go down there, you'll see an awful lot of industry in there now. I should double check, yeah. I'm, I'm not as aware of the of things that, uh, events in the last little while. I'll double check. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything, all of my sources, which aren't quite current, say that it was still there, but I will double check. You know, and again, it might just be sort of picking away at it, whittling away at the uh, edges of the AR. Very good. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Not so much related to history, but uh, related to agriculture. I was wondering, maybe you might have some information. Uh, in the neighborhood here, there are two lots for community parcels, community gardens, which are very tiny, like a room or even smaller, or like a parking lot. Basically, one is by New Life Community Church, and one is uh, here by the school. Um, and I was wondering, when, where in the history did this um, um, hobby thing um, of community parcels where people can either pay rent or just take a lot for a number of years, and they have to con contribute a certain number of community hours, but they can cultivate and hope that nobody will steal their produce from the land? You know, I don't quite know the origins of of the modern community garden There's movement. One in Vancouver, which has been running for 26 or seven years. And I think that's the longest running community garden that I've seen that is operating in Vancouver. But I definitely think it ties in with what Eric was saying about the different zoning. I and mean, when you see the rise of people uh, living and staying in apartments and you're not moving into a suburb and you still want to have a, a community garden. So it would say definitely within the last 30, 35 years, we've been seeing the rise of those. And a very sharp increase from the last time. But, but it's no accident. I mean, I mean, again, I don't know the details, but there are activists, commu uh, community garden activists in the last 10 or 15 years who've been pushing to have these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's part of food security. And, you know, the urban agricultural movement is, uh, you know, has been going on. It's not something I follow, but uh, it's definitely there's you know, forces at work out there to encourage these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I think Burnaby's restricted some of its bylaws. I think it, uh, I mean, recently allowed you to keep bees. Uh...